Hello, this is Daniel Lawrence Smith, Associate Director of Training at Outney Cool Workplace Advocates. I'd like to welcome each of you to our July 2015 monthly town call. This is a broadcast audio recording. You can reach us at www.readytalk.com and use access code 694-6521, and you can hear the audio through the speakers on your computer. A few announcements from Out and Equal. Our August 27th will be our next monthly town call. We'll be focusing on U.S.-based EEOC policies on Title VII and how that affects diversity and inclusion in the workplace. Our next monthly town call will be on September 24th. October 5th will be the leadership day of our 2015 Out and Equal Workplace Summit, a great opportunity to delve into issues on workplace equality and diversion. And October 6th through 8th will be our Out and Equal Workplace Summit in Dallas, Texas. I'd like to welcome our panelists today on To Market to Market, Reaching LGBT Consumers. We first have Bob Wittick from Wittick Communications, John Lake from Wells Fargo, and Ian Johnson, CEO of Out Now. With that, I'd like to turn it over to Bob Wittick. Daniel, thank you so much, and uh, hello to all our great friends at Out and Equal everywhere. Um, I want to give you today a thumbnail of what uh, I project to be the uh, snapshot or at least the glimpse of what the demographics and uh, emerging trends are with the LGBT marketplace. I want to do it in a way it's fairly high level, uh, but I want to go through some data because I want to drive uh, the story into the particulars of uh, contemporary marketing strategies and just give you a, a taste of what the um, marketplace looks like. To begin, uh, we project roughly 16 million adults in the United States self-identify uh, as L, G, B, and or T. Um, and so far as we know, the range, uh, the true range or estimate of LGBT population varies. And the low end of the dial probably tells us it's around 9 to 10 million, up to as high as 25 or 26 million. We've come at it in a fairly median uh, or conservative approach based on over 100 samples we've done with the Harris Poll over almost 15 years in which roughly 6.7% of all samples confidentially captured identify as uh, lesbian, gay, bisexual, and or transgender. So it gives us a, a ballpark figure to think about. But again, it's not easy to, uh, to estimate numbers of people who are tough to count. But indeed, um, as uh, the Williams Institute has guided my work over many years um, in the demographics arena, is uh, that 8.2% of adults report they've engaged in same-sex sexual behavior, and that would put it at roughly 19 million adults. However, 26 million Americans also say they acknowledge at least some same-sex attraction. So the spectrum of same-sex attraction and identity is a variable. Um, so that's why I think using a conservative figure of roughly 16 cents and gives us a, a, a place to imagine what the U.S. marketplace looks like. Again, we're going to go globally in, in the presentations today, but I wanted to give you at least a U.S.-centric point of view to begin. Uh, this past year, uh, aggregating all of the, um, the best data we have about disposable personal income, which U.S. Department of Labor puts uh, calls DPI, Disposable Personal Income, uh, buying power. It reflects all the um, the assets or income an uh, individual has during the course of a year minus taxes paid. So uh, that figure for last year would put it at roughly $884 billion. And to keep in mind, that's in an uh, entire economy that is between $13 it's our share of what that economy or economic footprint looks like. It doesn't connote wealth. It doesn't suggest that LGBT people are wealthier than others. In fact, there's ample data to suggest there's some forms of economic discrimination um, and marginalization that uh, gay people feel in the economy. And therefore, this is not a, a figure that uh, suggests that we are privileged. In fact, there's ample evidence to the contrary. Uh, buying power, though, has other attributes to it, which I like to underscore. Um, to begin with, uh, Pew Research of uh, about two years ago pointed out uh, something we've tracked for a long time, over almost 20 years, that um, many LGBT people say they have not bought a product or service because the company 
not supportive of LGBT rights, but again, roughly the same figure, half of the um, sample says they've specifically bought a product or service. That's the upside of um, the LGBT um, uh, loyalty in supporting companies and brands that are supportive of LGBT rights, something we're seeing over and over again. And, and Mark, of course, year in and year out, uh, often by the um, human rights campaigns, Mark, of um, best places to work, the Corporate Equality Index. Uh, companies that score 100% on it obviously get to use that mark, and they've used it uh, quite successfully in a lot of marketing campaigns. Interestingly, I'd like to point to the neighborhood uh, data because it's interesting that almost um, 7 out of 10 LGBT people say they never lived in a neighborhood known for being an LGBT neighborhood. 12% say they currently live in one. The reason I think it's of interest for a number of reasons, I think those figures are going to change over time um, and they keep getting further apart because neighborhoods as an idea is changing. Um, a lot of... Uh, uh, um, Geography of gay demographics tells us again and again while neighborhoods or neighborhoods exist, the the central place in neighborhoods, for example, a gay bar, are going away. Um, there's a lot more integration changes in in society's acceptance, and again, um, while there are examples of concentrations throughout the world, um, the, the state of neighborhood is now becoming more of a social or or virtual construct. Because um, obviously, community is also found online, which is the major difference, I think. Um, I wanted to give you a, a, just a snapshot again of some things that we are going to see. I want to underscore them because I think they're going to change a lot about the LGBT economy, how we think about it. Marriage relationship uh, recognition and family formation are going to be the major. Uh, market trends. We're going to see now that uh, the United States has adopted marriage equality. I I predict that Australia and then more of Latin America and the balance of Europe will, you know, fairly quickly follow. I'd say within five years, those are likely changes that's going to uh, that will happen in more of the developed world. We'll also see some some of the uh, more hostile criminalization changes in parts of uh, regions too, particularly I believe in the Caribbean. I really think there's push and pull in the economy in the Caribbean to bring about those changes. I think I understand has held it by this year. In addition, uh, very important to underscore is the role of the millennial market. Uh, millennials are redefining what we think of as the gay market. In fact, I've often called it now the millennial market. The acceptance, the inclusiveness, the interests of uh, the millennials is is uh, truly aligned with LGBT interests and uh, gay rights issues. And I think what it's doing is changing the shape of uh, marketers and workplace leaders to imagine that they're not just focusing on the acceptance of gay people, but the de desires and demands of millennials that we do so. They have done it in the political arena. They're doing it in the economy. Authenticity rules. I think some of the examples you'll see in this webinar will tell you this story. What we're asking in the economy is that we are seen for who we are and we're captured in the act of living. In other words, we're looking for less and less stock photography. We're looking for examples of real people, real families, in the act of being consumers or being uh, living, breathing examples of friends and neighbors and family. Uh, there's a lot of more reality-based um, marketing, and it's showing up in terms of, of popularity. The global gains, the LGBT footprint is going to grow with economic ambition. What I mean by that is very simple. All of us um, are desired to uh, take our, our careers and our families where we find possibilities, where we find. And that means it's a global opportunity. Um, what's going to happen is demands of uh, multinational employers to recreate, insofar as possible, conditions that are accepting and, and for our families on the same conditions, circumstances as, as everyone else's, even if those societies themselves don't have laws of acceptance and uh, support, the employers will find ways to uh, even the playing field and make it possible for gay families, same-sex families, to live much as they live in the United States insofar as they can. But I think that will definitely then change the way, the shape of the workforce in the marketplace to look more like the U.S. marketplace.
that's my uh, story. I just want to leave you with those thoughts, and thank you for allowing me to be part of this. I think we're going to get a great deal more specific examples of the, some of the trends I've talked about, but I wanted to make sure that I gave you a good uh, foundation for what it looks like from my Thank you. Bob, I want to thank you for participating today and sharing your insight. And now I would like to turn it over to Ian Johnson, CEO of OutNow. Well, uh, hello, everybody, and uh, Bob, uh, and uh, thank you both for great presentations today. Um, OutNow is an LGBT specialist consulting agency. Uh, we were set up primarily looking at marketing, so this topic today is very close to our heart. Uh, we have since then evolved to include a full diversity practice as well, but we think that better LGBT marketing means better business for a whole range of different kinds of brands. Um, over the years, we've been fortunate to work with many leaders um, out globally. Um, we work with communications, with training and networking. We do. It's a Uh, show as much as in the world basic things major events like Mardi Gras commanding widespread community support sponsorship and television coverage now more than ever mainstream Australian corporations are vying for those vital pink dollars yes I think with um, with larger companies like Telstra um, Toyota I mean they're making a huge effort um, and I think they really are trying to target us. Other major players include Bonds, Qantas and Orlando Wines who've just spent $50,000 launching Havana Club Rum specifically for the gay market. $50,000 is a lot of money but our experience has been that that is well worthwhile because um, uh, the, the gay community definitely get behind products like this when they're well and truly targeted at them. James Ede is National Marketing Manager for Gay Mag Campaign. Over the past few years, his advertising revenue has increased by over 20%, the result of mainstream corporations entering the gay media minefield. There has been a need, obviously, for certain consultancy groups to be set up that will specifically target the gay community, have knowledge of the gay community, have done the research, and also know from an apocryphal level, i.e. being gay or lesbian, what it's all about. Marketing firms like significant others. Consultant Ian Johnson advises companies on how to target the gay and lesbian market. The reality of what we do is to create a win-win situation so that the gay and lesbian community have their consumer needs met in a way that makes them feel good about our clients' brands. Ian recently organised Australia's first gay and lesbian consumer expo. By bringing both sides of the marketplace together, companies are learning not to impose their mainstream heterosexual ads on an unappreciative gay audience. When it's a male and female co a couple romping along a beach in Fiji, Absolutely, then you just laugh. because it's completely irrelevant. <laughs> if you want to talk to us, talk our language. And while some gay-specific television commercials are becoming more risque, like this award-winning effort for the latest Jenny Morris album, the stereotypes still abound. The Anna Bache 20% off cleanser sale is on now. One of the big do's and don'ts is do not stereotype the consumer. Which is why the latest American offerings are so successful. This IKEA commercial takes a candid slice of life approach, yet to be seen in Australia. We've been together about three years. I met Steve at my sister's wedding. Yeah, I met at his sister's wedding. And that particular piece of, uh, of footage is from an IKEA commercial which showed in the mid-90s and was shown one time only in two metropolitan markets in the US, but it made such a great impact because it spoke to a mainstream audience and to an LGBT audience and it presented two gay men in a completely natural manner and it was authentic. It helped the people watching it to understand that there was respect and authenticity in the way that this brand, IKEA, were communicating with the LGBT community. Um, now, lest somebody think that uh, I haven't aged, I have in fact aged. Um, I, do, I do thank uh, Wells Fargo very much for the use of their stagecoach at a recent um, equal event. Um, if you get a chance to jump in, it's well worth it. Okay, let's see what some of our key message takeouts from this presentation should be. Um, in pure marketing terms, 
What LGBT marketing is all about is to understand a group of people and to meet their needs. Um, as I said in the video piece, what you're trying to accomplish is to make LGBT people feel good about the way that your organization chooses to conduct itself in relation to interacting with them. Um, the four basic marketing P's are your product, your price, your promotion and your place or the distribution of your product. But to this, in LGBT marketing, we always add a fifth P. Uh, we add people. Uh, it's, it's key to us at Out Now that LGBT spells people. By placing LGBT people at the center of all that you do in an LGBT marketing sense, you are most likely to succeed. Um, I just want to um, show a sobering slide. Uh, Google.com no longer allows this particular search functionality. Uh, the autofill up until a few weeks ago would show you what the most common searches for LGBT people are across the world. And as recently as just a few weeks back, these are the most common searches about LGBT people. I mention this because it's important as brands and organizations that we recognize LGBT people are uh, living and working in a world that is not always as supportive as they might like. So target marketing. How do we define who our target market is when we think of the diversity within LGBT marketing? Is this the target market? Is this a typical gay man? Is this a typical lesbian couple? Or are these women? Is this person a typical LGBT customer? Well, the answer is they all are part of the LGBT community, but it's important in LGBT marketing that you avoid stereotypes. Um, one of the things we're often asked by clients is, oh, the Pride Parade, thousands of people come to our city and, and they come and they look at the floats. So there's a lot of, of profile for a brand. Now, I, I live in Utrecht in the Netherlands and a few weeks back, the Tour de France happened to come to the end of my street, literally. So I walked 20 meters down the road waiting for the bicycles to turn up, but I didn't see bikes at first. What I saw was this. I saw a Bostic lizard, a glue gun, um, and this kind of product placement or promotion for a brand is something we see in the Tour de France, but there's also, and uh, any brands I mentioned in this presentation, they're all great brands doing great things for LGBT people. Uh, and so this is not to pick anyone out, but when you think of an LGBT parade or even LGBT media, what your brand is doing is entering community space the LGBT community have built a culture of which they're justifiably proud. And so they are looking for brands and organizations to respect them within that culture. So sometimes going into a pride parade um, is tempting. Uh, but as we saw in Chicago in 2015, more than half of all floats were corporate floats, such as this one, which is admittedly for a gay men's video bar, an LGBT video bar in, in, um, in Boys Town in Chicago. But the branding that was evident on that float is becoming more and more of a concern to LGBT people. As brands enter pride parades, we see comments such as this, homos and their supporters are expected to compliantly toddle along behind corporations. So don't forget, LGBT spells people. People like this man with his fist raised. 30 years ago, he was at the head of the London Pride Parade. Miners who were involved in a strike were supported by group of gays and lesbians and they led the 1980 pride parade um, 30 years later in 2015 they were supposed to lead the parade in London but someone decided that the corporate sponsors should go first this led to a, a big backlash against many of those corporate sponsors uh, it even led to a coffin with the word pride on top uh, entering the parade and being removed eventually as a protest against the corporations that were seen as taking over a community space. So be careful about how you conduct yourself with the LGBT community. Try remembering this. It's you, your brand, or even your staff. Successful LGBT marketing puts the customer front and center every time. As we say, spells people. If you make the LGBT customer the true star of your campaign, you will do much better. Um, we have here some examples such as natural inclusion. Um, I should mention before I go there that 
we actually have been testing uh, in more than 20 countries across the world. So if you're interested in global data, please contact us. We have data across the Middle East, Asia, Africa. We have India, Australia, Japan, and so on. Uh, we have Latin America, North America, uh, and Europe, of course. So that we have a, a lot of metrics around workplace diversity and also around LGBT marketing. So do feel free to contact us if you'd like any data from a global perspective. Um, in terms of your marketing and advertising, try this, natural inclusion. Focus on the customer. This is an out-and-out piece of creative that was for Lloyds Bank in the UK. And this was nominated for a European Diversity Award in the Best Advertising category. What makes this an LGBT creative is we have two gentlemen, and the headline is telling us that these two men are turning a house into a dream home. And the copy which appears in the advertisement is uh, very clear and straightforward. It says that Lloyd's is, help, is, is looking forward to helping LGBT customers with their savings needs. Um, or this example, don't forget that uh, the L in LGBT means lesbians. So this is a lesbian-specific campaign for Stockholm Visits Board. And uh, this particular year, Stockholm spent all of their marketing budget on uh, a women's-focused lesbian campaign. And it was, in fact, the most successful social media campaign that Stockholm had ever undertaken. We were very pleased to work on that one with them. Now, it does take time. It won't happen overnight but with a good strategy, LGBT marketing can succeed. Um, Germany is a long-term out-and-out client for 12 years. They've been very consistent for success. Um, focus on real people. Um, don't be afraid to include actual... Uh, this is a real uh, gay male couple about to get married in uh, England uh, in 2014 when marriage equality laws came into England and Wales. So uh, Out Now created this ad, which was nominated for an award as well. And um, this is all about showing authentic people. Reality uh, can sell. Um, it's about being credible, being authentic, and meaning it. Uh, don't try too hard, but be genuine. The, the, key, the keys to success that we would recommend you take away from this would be, the first thing is to understand the customer. And to do this, you should consider market research. Um, secondly, communicate that understanding to the customer. You know, let them feel good about the way that you are conducting your business. And then thirdly, welcome the customer comfortably. Um, and that may mean staff training. So there are certain training workshops that Out Now runs to help customer-facing staff become the most comfortable they can be with, uh, with helping LGBT people as customers. In terms of what's next, just in closing, I would like to share with you some allies research. Out Now is launching. Uh, we're, we're measuring how many allies people have in the workplace, and we're reporting on that in a free piece of research, which will, will be released in 2016. We already know some data. We know that, for example, in the US, uh, the, the median response of LGBT people say that they have five allies at work, and they have three allies amongst their family. You can get involved and learn more about this project at um, www.work.lgbt. Um, we're very pleased to announce that uh, AXA have signed on as a global sponsor of this particular piece of work. Um, so do feel free to become a part of it. Uh, we have a sounding board happening now and we have data collection happening later in 2015 and we'll be reporting on that at the start of 2016. We'll also preview some of this research at the Out and Equal conference in Dallas in 2015. Uh, one last thing, if you haven't already got your copy, please feel free to download for free from www.outnow.lgbt, the LGBT Diversity Show Me the Business Case Report. It measures in dollars and cents exactly what workplace diversity means to your business, both in terms of productivity and, and savings that you, you generate by retaining quality LGBT people because they feel able to come out at work. Um, we heard from Bob about millennials. It's absolutely correct. Generation X and millennials um, are in majority support of marriage equality. This is a good indicator of our LGBT acceptance generally. Um, the reality is that we all need to be positioning our businesses to prepare for 2020 and 2030, um, and our LGBT 2030 research study is all about that. Um, the takeouts, uh, product, price, promotion, place, but the one that we put the most emphasis on it out now is, is people. Um, the only things I have left to say is that if you would like any information, please feel free to us. You can email start 
outnowconsulting.com. And uh, you can also uh, go to outnow.lgbt. And uh, my final word is to thank all of you for your time today and uh, very much uh, honoured uh, to be a part of this presentation for Out and Equal. Thank you all. Thank you, Ian, and I'd like to thank all of our panelists, Bob Whittick, John Lake, and Ian Johnson, for sharing your time and your insights today. And I would also like to thank each and every one of you for spending this time with us. We hope that you have some great takeaways from just a reminder, our Out and Equal Workplace Summit will be in Dallas, Texas, October 6th through 8th. A great opportunity to come together with 2,500 of your best friends to discuss pressing matters of diversity and inclusion in the workplace. We'll have over 100 unique educational opportunities, and we hope to see each and every one of you there. Our next monthly town call will be on Thursday, August 27th, where we will talk about Title VII and the EEOC and how that affects federal protections in the United States on workplace equality. On behalf of OutNequal, I want to thank each and every one of you for joining us today. There will be a brief survey at the end of the call, and we want to know about your experience, so please go ahead and fill that out and let us know. Once again, thank you all for joining us, and we hope you have a great day.